Okay. Um, well, it's great to see uh, a large uh, and I and I presume enthusiastic audience here. Not that long ago, uh, a, an event like this about the GDPR would have drawn 10 or 15 people, probably. Uh, it has been um, long and, and unjustly uh, ignored by a lot of companies, as we'll demonstrate here in some of the data. Uh, GDPR, a business design approach. That title is, is a little unusual. It's a little awkward, but I, I hope that during the course of, of my uh, hour or so, uh, I'll be able to justify why I'm calling it a business design approach. And uh, as you can already tell, I'm an American and therefore not a native speaker of English, so bear with me. Uh, two words about my company. Just note that it is contentadvisory.net, not .com. Uh, in addition to helping companies come to terms with the GDPR, we uh, advise and consult around customer experience, um, digital transformation, digital disruption, and uh, above all, content marketing. My partner and the founder of the content advisory, Robert Rose, is indisputably one of the world's top, top experts on uh, content marketing and has, uh, has authored or co-authored these three books, uh, in addition to others, I believe. If you go to the site, uh, all of my ar recent articles about the GDPR are available there, such as Seven Things Marketers Need to Know. Uh, this one with a, a little, little kind of snotty little title because <laughs> I got angry with investors, VCs, and, and private equity firms not paying attention to the GDPR. Uh, and this one in particular, which is also published on LinkedIn, as most of them are, uh, which is arguing for the attention that should be paid and I think must be paid by design agencies, d designers, digital agencies to the GDPR and to helping companies come to terms with it. And it's good to see that a number of, of agency partners are here today. And I'll certainly be interested in, um, in hearing from you afterwards in the break about whether you think I've made the, made the case here. So very, very importantly, uh, I am not a lawyer. And unlike Gregory Peck, I do not play one in the movies. So nothing that I say here should be taken as legal advice. You should absolutely, I would insist that you seek out uh, legal vetting and verification of any plans that you make for the GDPR based upon anything that you take away from, from what I have to say. Uh, I think a better analogy, if this works in the, in the UK context, uh, is that I'm like a real estate agent, an estate agent, I guess you call them. Um, that is, I'm showing you around this, this property uh, called the GDPR. Uh, I can describe its history. I can lead you through the, you know, the spacious rooms and also point out the nooks and crannies that you might overlook. I can talk about the parts of it that are incomplete or potentially dangerous. I've spoken to the architects. I've spoken to some of the builders. I'm regularly in touch with them as they, uh, as they try to put on the finishing touches and so on and so forth. Um, however, if you want to buy this property, and you must buy this property if you want to continue doing business in the EU, then of course you're going to want to consult uh, legal and other experts in order to um, facilitate that purchase. Some of the terminology that we'll be using, you're probably familiar with most of these. Of course, the GDPR. The directive is the Directive 9546 EC, uh, which was the previous um, EU data protection legislation. The EPR, very, very important piece of uh, regulation, the e-privacy regulation, uh, but it's a work in progress. It has not yet um, been released in its final form. We don't know exactly when it will be released in its final form. Uh, and we don't know when it will be uh, actually, uh, when it will be legislatively in effect. DPAs are data protection authorities. Every M EU member state has at least one. Germany has 13, um, which tells you something about data protection in Germany. Um, and uh, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, is the UK's DPA. Article 29 Working Party, this is a little more obscure, but this is a group made up of, uh, of a number of DPAs and EU-level uh, data protection uh, officers, uh, and they basically get together and try to clarify points of law, clarify things that are not, that are in dispute or that need more guidance, more, more clarification. They issue what are called opinions. And one opinion in particular that I'll be pointing to later on, WP217, that's the Working Party 217, uh, was issued in 2014 around this very, still very obscure notion of legitimate interest. And we'll cover that uh, in a bit. 
Okay, I won't go through all the agenda items because you're going to experience it whether you like it or not. So I got into business relatively late uh, in my life. I used to be a professor, and, and one of my early mentors um, pointed out to me something that you guys all know and all understand, that when you're going to do a presentation like this, you want to tell people what you're going to say, and then you want to spend some time saying it, and then you want to conclude by reminding them what you've said. And that's very, very sound advice, and I've always ignored it. Um, it seems to me to be extremely unappealing and unappetizing and uninteresting, and I've rather been seduced by, by the dark side, so to speak, um, by the urge to tell a story uh, with, you know, story arc and conflict and resolution and so forth. But, however, uh, maybe you, to your relief, given that we're today talking about an EU regulation and what could be more gruel-like than that, uh, I'm going to compromise, so I will heed part of the of my mentor's advice, and I will preview the important uh, denouement of this story. Um, but I will, in, in effect, reveal, and I hope this isn't a spoiler alert for nobody who's seen The Princess Bride, that, or somebody who has not seen The Princess Bride, that Wesley does enter the castle and face down Prince Humperdinck and battle for the heart and hand of uh, Buttercup. So here it is. The ICO, your beloved ICO, says, those organizations which thrive under GDPR will be those who recognize that the key feature of GDPR is to put the individual at the heart, speaking of hearts, of data protection law. Now, even more importantly, thinking first about how people want their data handled and then using those principles to underpin how you go about preparing for GDPR means you won't go far wrong. Okay? The Deputy Commissioner of the ICO. And when I saw this the first time, and maybe for, for you as well, I just, why is he saying this? It's as if you're waiting for uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the US to specify precisely how many you know, particulates you can emit from your smokestacks per metric ton of emission or whatever. And they say instead, think of the children playing in their yards downwind from your factory, and you won't go far wrong. That's, you know, what kind of advice is that? What kind of behavior is that? We expect from our regulators, we expect guidance and checklists and what is called legal certainty. Uh, and instead, they're basically saying, it seems to me they're saying in this um, statement, be nice. Be nice and you won't go far wrong. And so what I'm really going to be doing for most of my, of my time up here is trying to make sense of this statement. I don't think it's fanciful. I, don't, I think this is very serious. I think it represents the considered opinion of the ICO. So how can we make sense of this in light of an EU regulation which business people would like to approach in a checklist kind of way? Just tell me what I have to do so I can get on with my business. And, I, and my point is, again, to reveal where I'm going, I don't think you're going to get satisfaction if you approach the regulation in that way. Just tell me what I have to do so I can get on with my business. And I'm gonna to try to prove that. So in order to do that, I in fact need to tell you a little bit of a story. So barely 10 years ago, an object around half the size of a pack of cigarettes and traveling at the speed of a Steve Jobs keynote presentation began to emerge from stores in North America. And while Steve Ballmer and the CEOs of Nokia, RIM, and Sony Ericsson literally laughed at it, it began slowly but inexorably, and we now know inevitably, to fundamentally change the course of life on the planet. Uh, eight months from yesterday, that's 241 days from now, 163 working days. A, another object consisting of 99 articles and 173 so-called recitals, over 261 pages in the English version, and traveling at the speed of an EU bureaucratic resolution, which means it took almost five years for it to escape the city limits of Brussels, will fundamentally change the course of life for every company that does business in Europe, or more precisely, every company that touches the personal data of any resident of the EU. 
So, you don't want to end up being like Steve Ballmer. Okay? He could have reacted appropriately 10 years ago or seven years ago or five years ago. He could have recognized that the environment had been fundamentally transformed by the shift to mobile and ubiquitous computing. Uh, and he could, his company could have adapted to that new environment. To be sure, he was not a failure, Ballmer was a great executive, but he and Microsoft in general were blinded by their success, by their success uh, as a PC, uh, their success in a PC and browser-based world, and it was impossible for him to uh, see the looming transition to mobility and ubiquitous computing. Now, to be fair, even Steve Jobs didn't understand uh, what transformative force he was unleashing with the first iPhone. Famously, he resisted the uh, launching of the uh, App Store until a year later in 2008. So for you guys, the point of this story is that you have a distinct advantage. Because unlike Balmer and Jobs, who were trying to look into the future and predict, or failing to predict, what uh, effects and transformative effects something like the, the smartphone would have. And companies could do this all of the time, every day. What about AR? Are we ready for VR? Are we ready for the Internet of Things? So on and so forth. Executives or even your um, people in other roles in every company have to constantly be weighing the, the uh, potential impact of these future, these perceived future events and placing bets. And very, very often you are wrong. But the good news, so to speak, is that the GDPR is not that kind of future event. The GDPR, rather, the text of that document, 261 pages in English, is like a gift from the future. It's like that sports almanac in Back to the Future that Marty, if I get this right, Marty brings back from the future and it either makes him wealthy or it makes Biff wealthy or it makes both of them wealthy in parallel universes, I don't know. But the point is, it tells the future. The GDPR um, tells you quite precisely, not 100%, but tells you quite precisely what the business environment is going to look like, how it is going to change after May 25th, 2018. And so it um, gives you very, very good guidance on how you need to adapt in order to fit into that new environment, in order to survive in that environment, and hopefully not only to survive, but to thrive in that environment. So the GDPR has been called all of these things, a paradigm change, a revolution, not an evolution, uh, the, Inter the Interactive Advertising Bureau, of course, calls it a blunt instrument and draconian approach to data protection, a bomb placed into the plumbing of internet advertising and digital marketing, and uh, my favorite, a wooden stake through the heart of attention-sucking interruptive marketing, because I wrote that one. Um, so, we know that it is coming. We know that it is unavoidable. We know that it will be profoundly disruptive for all these reasons which we're going to be talking about today. And yet, in this last spring, I believe this survey was done in April and published in May of 2017, 84% of small and medium enterprises and 43% of C-suite executives in larger enterprises were not even aware of the GDPR regulations. And of those that were aware, somewhere between 60 and 90% haven't started doing even anything about it. And so with that kind of gap, that delta, that yawning difference between the, the predictable and unavoidable effects and impact of the GDPR uh, and uh, the, level, the, the level of awareness or the level of lack of awareness, we simply have to ask, why is this the case? And here are some of the justifications or excuses that I often hear from companies who are not doing anything. Okay, my company's not located in the EU. That doesn't apply to you guys, but I leave it in here because uh, look down at the bottom. It applies to any company that, one, offers goods and services to EU residents. That's relatively straightforward, but there are various ways in which the regulation suggests that you test to see whether you are offering goods and services. And secondly, any company that monitors the behavior 
of EU residents, even without offering them goods and services. So you think about all of those companies that populate the so-called Lumascape, I think 5,600 and something in the 2017 Lumascape, a lot of these companies, hundreds of these companies do nothing but monitor behavior. They provide tracking services, surveillance services of one kind or another. They are going to be profoundly disrupted uh, by the GDPR. And um, Johnny Ryan over at PageFair graphically illustrated that in this, in this way. Okay? Now, that probably doesn't apply directly to any of you, but on the other hand, you are also probably using, even if you're not aware of it, some number, perhaps dozens of those kinds of services now. And you're going to have to figure out how to deal with either replacing them or making sure that they are behaving equally, uh, they are complying with the GDPR uh, as much as you are trying to because uh, of something called joint liability that we'll look at in a moment. Okay, a second argument is the regulators are going to soft pedal enforcement, right? This granted, in other words, now we say, oh my God, this is going to be genuinely disruptive. Surely they won't expect us to be compliant on May 25th. Right? That's only eight months from now, so on and so forth. And yet, I think this is again Rob Luke from the ICO, will there be a grace period after May 25th? No, there will not be. Right? You will see a common sense pragmatic approach to regulatory principles. In other words, we're not going to start burning down houses immediately, um, but we will focus on risk and we are going to enforce the regulation. And the reason here is, if you didn't know it, that the GDPR was actually adopted in, on May 25th, I think, or in any case, uh, sometime in the spring of 2016. And normally, you would expect a regulation to take effect as soon as it is formally adopted. But they knew that the GDPR was going to be uh, extremely difficult to manage for most companies, so they built in a two-year grace period between that date and May 25th, 2018. So there was a grace period. It's just the problem is that most companies have not taken advantage of it to uh, any significant effect. Some say uh, data laws are already harsh, so this isn't really a big deal. We're already doing all of this. Well, one, most companies aren't already following current data regulations because they are not terribly well enforced and the fines are not very big. I think the maximum, the maximum fine varies by member state. I believe in, uh, in Ireland it is 400,000 euros, the maximum fine uh, under the current directive. Um, so it's kind of, you can almost accept it as a cost of doing business. But secondly, just look at this list of things that are new in the GDPR compared to the, to the legislation that um, followed or flowed from the Directive 95. And my hobby horse, okay, don't worry, compliance and legal will take care of it. Now this is understandable because the thing is unfortunately called the General um, Data Protection Regulation. And who takes care of regulations? The compliance department, that's what they're there for, that's why we pay them. Who takes care of data protection? IT takes care of data protection. So IT and compliance will take care of the GDPR and we can just get on with business as usual. That's not uh, an adequate understanding of the GDPR. So as my friend Todd Ruback says, uh, it's not a, a IT responsibility, it's not a privacy responsibility, it's not a marketing responsibility, it's everybody's responsibility. It requires what I call a system level reaction. Uh, and the DMA, this is the DMA, which represents direct marketers. Um, data protection is now firmly a board level issue and should be seen as a critical business risk rather than a compliance issue alone. Uh, good American attitude, we'll just pay the fines. We'll just work it into the cost of doing business. Okay? It's just like paying for, you know, paving the parking lot. Well, you won't because those fines are now massively higher than they were in the past. Up to 20 million euros or 4% of a company's global gross revenue. 4% of BMW's 2016 revenue is about 3 billion euros. Now, you've probably also heard that all of this talk about the huge fines that are going to be imposed under the GDPR is just scaremongering. And in fact, Elizabeth Denham, who is the information commissioner, right, the head of the ICO, 
had felt it necessary to say a few weeks ago um, to clarify this scaremongering, right? We're not gonna be making early examples of organizations for minor infringements, uh, blah, blah, blah. Our commitment will be, to, will be to guiding and helping and educating, et cetera. I think that's absolutely right. So in other words, we're going to uh, put aside the stick whenever possible and concentrate on the carrots. The problem is, what if your, the uh, party that you're trying to help is a carnivore? and they don't eat carrots, and they resist all of your attempts to educate and advise and help them adopt the uh, regulation uh, and the data protections for um, data subjects under the GDPR, then I'm sure that somebody is going to receive a substantial fine. Okay, so much for the uh, excuses or justifications. Where does this come from? The GDPR replaces the directive, as I said. The directive, as the name indicates, was uh, formulated in 1995. That is before the web as we know it today, before social media, before the digitalization of every aspect of our daily lives, and before um, uh, data, and therefore personal data, became something that uh, could be copied and distributed around the world uh, in microseconds. Um, a little bit of nerdy stuff, but the directive is a directive, and an EU directive means that it basically is saying to the member states, do what you need to do in order to pass laws within your member state that reflect the aims of this directive. And of course, when they did that, they very predictably ended up with 28 variations of the directive across the 28 member states. That creates still a real nightmare for businesses who have to very carefully track what they can do in Ireland versus what they can do in France versus what they can do in Germany. The GDPR is thankfully a regulation, which means there is virtually no, there's very, very little enabling legislation that is required from the member states. So that means that, if, if you can believe it, the EU regulators, the, the for, the, those who formulated the GDPR, genuinely believe that it has business positive benefits that it is helpful for businesses. One, because it creates or aims to create what they call a digital single market. Uh, instead of 28 different sets of rules, we will have, in principle, one set of rules. Also, very importantly, it levels the playing field against non-EU competitors, because under the directive, companies located outside of the EU do not have to follow those, uh, most of those regulations. Uh, and under the GDPR, it applies to every company anywhere in the world that is touching the personal data of uh, EU residents. And then also it creates an opportunity, and we'll get to this at the close, for brands to position as personal data shepherds rather than data predators. And very important, it's not just Brussels sprouting about data misuse. Similar restrictions are in place or planned in Australia, Brazil, China, Colombia, Japan, Malaysia, South Africa, in the U.S., following the Congress's uh, early 2017 repeal of the FCC restriction on the ability of Internet service providers to collect personal data without consent, uh, numerous states, I think more than two dozen states, uh, and then municipalities like the city of Seattle have, begun, have passed or are considering restrictions on the collection of personal data by ISPs, okay? which is exactly the opposite of what businesses really want to see because now you're gonna to have to start tracking on a city by city basis in the US what you can and cannot do. And the fact that we as consumers are continuing to adopt uh, ad blockers, which I insist are really should be called tracking blockers, um, indicates that uh, we've reached a point of um, putting our foot down about data collection and, and use without consent. So you see what I did here with Brussels sprouting. Um, this was my tweet about the connection between the GDPR and um, cabbage. Okay, remember the legal disclaimer? So here's an analogy that I think is a helpful way to understand what the, um, what the regulators are getting at. If someone wants to borrow your car, um, presumably you wouldn't loan your car to a complete stranger, but somebody who lives in your building or lives down the block, you kind of know who they are, uh, and they come and they need to borrow your car, there's a whole set of explicit and implicit understandings that are going to have to transpire in order for that transaction to take place. That is, you're going to want to know, if I want to borrow your car, what am I going to do with it? What, when am I going to bring it back? 
uh, and so on and so forth. So I say, well, I need to take my mother to the doctor and my car's in the garage and it's 25 miles away and I'll be back by noon. And you say, fine, you give me the keys. I don't come back until 10 p.m. I've driven 700 miles and I filled up the trunk of your car with manure to fertilize my garden on the way home. Okay? That's a gross violation of our, <laughs> of our understanding. Right? Um, so you don't, you would not, I, I should not um, substitute another purpose for uh, the stated purpose without asking for your further consent and so forth. And while I have your car, if I'm conscientious, I'm going to be extremely careful with it, much more careful than I would be with my own car. I'm going to drive it extremely carefully. I'm going to park it in the far uh, extremes uh, of the parking lot to make sure it doesn't get dinged. I'm going to, obviously, I'm not going to loan it to someone else. I'm not going to represent it as my own property uh, and so forth. Um, and if you think about that in comparison to the way that many companies, I won't say your company necessarily, you can tell me later, um, many companies treat ca borrowing cars like this. Okay? Find the car that you want and take it and then treat it as your own. And after you can't get any more value out of it, sell it to someone else. Okay? That's again the delta between the approach that, uh, that the GDPR wants you to take uh, and the ones that many, many companies are currently taking. So basically, the point is, the GDPR puts personal back into data, into the notion of personal data, because we've begun to think that personal data is just, it's digital exhaust. It's just there in the air, so why not collect it? Uh, or, or you can vacuum it, you can vacuum up personal data when someone comes to your site, because after all, they're on your site, right? Uh, or you can follow them around the web by placing cookies uh, and, and, and charting their um, browsing experiences regardless of where they go, and so on and so forth. Now, the GDPR does not literally um, treat uh, um, personal data as property. It doesn't subsume it under property law, uh, but, and I wouldn't know what it meant if they did, um, but uh, I think it's a good way of understanding how they want you to treat it. It's like borrowing some valuable piece of property from someone. And then, so that means they also want to put personable back into buyer-seller relationships. When you borrow, when you use, when you collect and process someone's personal data, they want you to be like that good neighbor. The good neighbor who tells you exactly what he or she is going to do with your car and does only that, and brings it back and returns it to you as soon as they are done with it. Um, very, very importantly, the, the, there, I've seen a couple of articles recently about loopholes within the GDPR, and there are certainly areas that are not very well defined, and especially as it applies to companies that are not literally located in the EU, there, there will certainly be some ways that those companies can try to get away with more than they should. But in general, keep in mind that the GDPR is not like um, well, I don't know about you guys, but the IRS tax code in the U.S., uh, you have to follow the letter of the tax code. And if you can find a gray area or a loophole, you can exploit it. And you can just say, hey, the, the regulation didn't say that I had to do this or that. That's not the way the GDPR works. It is a principles-based regulation. You must follow the principle. You must follow the aims. You must follow the spirit of the law, regardless of what this or that formulation within the regulation states. So um, you'll find, as we'll see, the regulators try to avoid giving prescriptive, um, being, try to avoid being prescriptive. For example, if you say, what counts as personal data? Well, if they, they do not fall into the trap of saying, here's a list of 5,000 things that count as personal data, because immediately that would be out of date because someone would find a way that's not on that list to identify you uh, and they would say, well, you didn't say that I couldn't use that as personal data. So they just uh, try to say personal data is anything that allows you to identify a person. If you come up with a clever way to identify them that we don't know about today, tomorrow, that will be personal data. And 30 years from now, any way that you can identify some will be personal data, uh, and so on and so forth. Right? So that notion that this is prescriptive helps understand why I don't think it's useful for companies to say, well, we're not acting yet because we're waiting for more guidance. We're waiting for more clarity. 
Yes, granted, around things like legitimate interest, for example, there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered. But the principles are solid. They are rock solid, and you must follow the principles. And there's more than enough work to be done starting two years ago, <laughs> that means starting tomorrow, on making sure your company embraces and reflects the principles, regardless of this or that nuance around something like legitimate interest. In short, this won't work, right? The new regulations will fundamentally change the way we get around them. Okay? It's, I think, not going to happen if the enforcement has any bite whatsoever. So, you can't innovate your way around the GDPR, but the, the, the regulators want you to innovate within it. They want this to uh, fuel a new creative wave within the EU and for any companies that are involved in the EU. They want you to figure out new, clever, inventive ways of doing business within the confines of the regulation. So yes, it does inevitably contain some thou shalt and thou shalt not, some prescriptions, uh, as we'll see in the second half, but mostly uh, it tries to avoid them for the sake of future-proofing it. And my um, central advice is do not think of the GDPR as a regulation that's like a straitjacket that you have to wear and still try to get on with business as usual. Think of it as a new rule book that is a rule book that has been given to you for a new kind of activity, a new sport. And your question, the question for you is, how do we adapt more quickly than the competition so that we can dominate in this new activity, dominate on this new playing field? So somebody, your, your children come home and say, hey, we started playing Quidditch. What's that? Well, it's like three-dimensional soccer. Well, how, well, <laughs> how is that going to work, right? Um, you don't know, but they will adapt to that, that new sport, and that's the way I think that you should look at the GDPR. So, this um, talk of personal data and control, for consumer control and trust is, of course, has been established for a couple of years now. It's far from unique to the GDPR. So, for example, CapEx, putting customers, uh, consumers at the heart of the personal data economy, taking back control, rethinking personal data, and Accenture says um, digital trust strengthening customer relationships through ethics and security. And 83% of the uh, business leaders that they surveyed said trust is the cornerstone of the digital economy. And then you go and look at the, at the GDPR itself. This is recital seven. It's about five pages in, I think, to the 261 page text. And it says, given the importance of creating trust that will allow the digital economy to develop across the internal market, Natural persons should have control of their own personal data. Okay? That second highlighted sentence is 10 words long, but let me come back to it for a moment, in a moment. <laughs> um, the very first recital, this is the opening of the GDPR. So you think, wh why would someone say natural persons should be in control of their own personal data? Well, because uh, as it's stated here, the protection of natural persons in relation to the processing of their personal data is a fundamental right registered in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. So it starts out in good legislative fashion, whereas, blah, 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 then natural persons should be in control of their own personal data. And, and my suggestion is, not legal advice, but I think it's a helpful way of understanding the text, those 10 words more or less represent exactly what the GDPR is trying to achieve. So you can reduce those 10 words to actually uh, eight words because natural persons are just people uh, and their own personal data is their personal data. That's their own is redundant. So people should have control of their personal data. And the rest of the text, the remaining 250 odd pages are basically um, laying out what has to happen in order to turn that should into a will. People will have, you will behave in such a way that people do have control of their personal data. If you do that, as Rob Luke says, you'll not be, uh, how does he say? You'll not be far off. You won't, you'll, be well, you'll be well off, okay? Because think about this. If you genuinely embrace the notion that people should be in control of their, um, of their personal data. If we take that to heart, 
what kinds of actions would follow from it? Okay. Anybody? Interactive moment here. What kind of business actions? I think of in your business environment, or just think about, again, that being that good neighbor and you're going to borrow something from someone. <laughs> Excuse me. Show respect. respect, good idea. They they What's that? They yeah, exactly, right? I mean, many, go ahead. Exactly. Don't represent it as your own. <laughs> don't let some, you know, don't borrow it and then let someone else borrow it without the permission of the person that it belongs to, right? And so forth. So, exactly. Things like tell them what you're going to do with it. Do only what you say. Give it back as soon as you are done. Make sure that it's safe while you are using it. Okay? If it is damaged while you are using it, tell them immediately that it was damaged. Okay? If they want it back before the agreed upon time, you give it back to them because it is theirs. Okay? So on and so forth. Okay? Um, tell the owner if you lose it. Okay? Those kinds of things which seem to me to follow commonsensically and inevitably, indisputably, from the notion that people should have control of their personal data, that's basically what the work of the GDPR is. So we see here in the so-called fundamental principles of data protection, Article 5 of, uh, of the GDPR. Personal data, shall, personal data shall be processed in a way that is lawful, fair, transparent. Sometimes those are counted as three different principles, but they're rolled up into the first principle. Um, it will be collected for uh, a specific explicit purpose and used only for that purpose. Okay? It will be data, minim, data will be minimized. That is, you will use only the amount of personal data necessary to achieve the stated purpose. Think about the impact of that, because basically what we, achieve, what we pursue now is data maximization. Collect as much personal data as possible and then figure out how to use it. It's basically the opposite of data minimization. It has to be accurate, and you're responsible for making sure that it's accurate. Um, it, storage limitations, that is, it needs to be deleted, returned, as it were, as soon as that specific purpose is completed. Not when you're tired of having it, not when you decide you can't get any more value out of it. It must be returned or deleted when the specific purpose for which it was borrowed is completed. Okay? And it must be secure. You compare those, the behaviors around those core principles with just the way that a simple um, programmatic advertising exchange works. And all this really illustrates is that in each one of these red circles, illustrating the, the consumer's the data subjects, as we say, the data subjects' personal data, that is how it flows through the ecosystem when, uh, when a site allows bidding on an advertising space. All of those parties are sharing in the personal data at that point. That is not a way, this does not reflect the principles of Article 5. Okay? So, as I said earlier, try to be a shepherd, aim to be a shepherd rather than a predator. So Simon Carroll says, wh why do you want to do that? Well, here's again the business benefit. When someone grants permission, they are acting consciously, they're becoming an active participant uh, rather than a passive source of data to be pill pillaged. Permission equals engagement. And that's finally what you want. You want engaged prospects, not prospects who are like sheep standing on a field waiting for the wolf to devour them. So, back to that house that I'm showing you. Um, like I say, you absolutely need uh, and want lawyers and other experts to, uh, in order to buy it and to clear the title and secure the contracts and blah, blah, blah. Right? Make sure that it is, you, are legally, uh, you have legal right to it. But you don't want the lawyers or the uh, information security professionals, excuse me if you're in the audience, to decorate the house. Okay? Now I'm speaking to you as marketers. Okay? You want to decorate the house, not just because it's a matter of your, your taste and your style, but because um, you're in charge of creating the environment that um, visitors, that is, site visitors, prospects, 
customers are going to find comfortable and appealing and engaging. You're, you're in charge of creating an environment that they want to spend time in and that they want to come back and spend more time in and that they want to tell their friends that they should come and spend time in. That's what you're doing with this property. That's what you need to do within the GDPR uh, with, with, with the available materials, with the materials that are available to you. And the question is, is should we take this notion of design seriously? Is this not going a little too far in trying to understand the, what is, after all, a regulation? And I think, yes, we can take it very seriously. Article 25 is about data protection by design. Data protection by design and default, strictly speaking. As so often in the GDPR, if you try, <laughs> if you try to read the article, you will be disappointed. Um, and instead, you go and look at the recitals. I've actually re read people who said, if you, if you don't want to read all 261 pages of the GDPR, just read the articles. Don't read the recitals. And I think that's fundamentally confused because the recitals are often the key to understanding what they're trying to get at in the articles. The recitals give you um, more color, at least, more detail, and often the outright examples. Okay? So if we go and look at recital 78, which is about data protection by design, I won't read all of this, and I won't even read the highlighted areas, uh, most of them. In order to be able to demonstrate compliance with this regulation, the controller, data controllers, will, should adopt, that means will adopt, must adopt, internal policies and implement measures which meet, in particular, the principles of data protection by design and data protection by default. And then, there are some of, some of you are certain, well, Kentico is a vendor. Many of you are service providers, like digital agencies, so this applies to you. When developing, designing, selecting, and using applications, services, and products that are based on processing personal data, um, uh, sorry, let me start again. Producers of the products, services, and applications used in the processing of personal data should be encouraged to take into account the right to data protection uh, when developing and designing such products. So that's you. Okay? Producers of the products, services, and applications used in personal data. So here's the gloss on this. In order to comply with the GDPR, as a data controller, you must practice data protection by design. This isn't a recommendation. You must practice it, and you must be able to prove that you practice it. Vendors and service providers should be encouraged to take into account the right to data protection and should be encouraged to make sure that buyers are able to fulfill their data protection obligations. So what does that mean? Since a data controller, that is say a brand, a data controller must practice data protection by design. That means when they select or they begin a selection process for a vendor, for a hardware vendor, a software vendor, or a service provider like a digital agency, they must, if they're behaving properly, they must very carefully vet every one of those prospective suppliers in order to determine the extent to which that supplier's product or service helps them achieve and practice data protection by design. Okay, you see what I mean? Now, most companies, I think, are not doing this yet. They do not know that they need to do this. But if they do know that they need to do it, then the vendors and service providers who can most easily show that they do it, who are in a position to say, oh yeah, data protection by design, let me show you exactly how our service helps you practice that, are obviously going to be at a competitive advantage. And if the selector, the, the prospective buyer, doesn't understand that they should be doing this, and you, as a service provider, are in a position to um, explain it confidently, you should let them know that they are obligated to do it, because you again achieve a competitive advantage uh, over against those who don't have a clue about how they help uh, achieve data protection by design. Okay, what is data protection by design? It's better known, if you go and look for information about it, as privacy by design. Very often in the GDPR, almost always in fact, when uh, the established term of art is privacy, blah, 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 privacy by design, for example, the regulation instead says data protection by design. Um, it was developed by um, a Canadian uh, privacy commissioner uh, in the 1990s, Ann Kavokian, uh, and basically says that data protection has to be embedded into every technology 
and every business process, this is not just about software development, although that's where the focus mostly lies, from the outset and through and through. Okay? And Anne Kavokian very importantly says, privacy must be approached from a design thinking perspective. So I'm beginning to justify my title about a business design approach. So I think this literally means that if you guys, some of you are marketers, if you go back to the office this afternoon and you have a meeting and you're planning some campaigns for Q1 of next year, well, I should say Q3 of next year, after the regulation has definitively taken, uh, taken effect, and someone stands up and goes up to the whiteboard and says, wait, I've got a great idea. If we could do this and this, th this outcome, et cetera, et cetera, from that moment, somebody in the room needs to be thinking about data protection by design. Because you're go you may be asked to prove that you built in data protection from the first step of that campaign that you're now building on the whiteboard. Huh? Anne Kavokian, or, or people associated with her, issued these seven foundational guidelines for privacy by design. Um, so proactive, not, uh, proactive, not reactive, end-to-end, -end, full functional, et cetera, et cetera. But the GDPR makes it easier because when you remember article, uh, paragraph one of article 25 says basically you must practice data protection by design and paragraph two of article 25 says basically the kinds of things that you need to do. The controller shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures for ensuring, okay? that only personal data which is necessary for each specific purpose are processed. Uh, this applies to the amount of data, the extent of the processing, the period of the storage. You see, it's referring back to Article 5. It's referring back to the principles in Article 5. The amount of storage limitation, purpose specification, so on and so forth. Okay? So basically, m my graphical way of understanding this, and I hope you find this useful, is that what I call the Ur Principe, okay? nobody else calls it that, is in Recital 7. People should be in control of their personal data. Okay? That implies, as we, as we saw, kind of logically requires something like the data processing principles in Article 5. And as we'll see later, also the subject access rights of, of uh, Articles 15 and following. Okay? And you actualize those principles by practicing data protection by design. And if you practice data protection by design, it's going to ensure or help ensure to a great extent that you're actually able to prove that you embrace and reflect in your business practices the or principe that people should be in control, that you actually aim to put them in control, that you build business processes that maintain them in control of their personal data. And just to kind of wrap it up, um, paragraph two of Article 5, okay? Remember, Article 5 first lists the, uh, the data protection principles. Paragraph two says, simply, the controller shall be responsible for and able to demonstrate compliance with this paragraph, okay? With paragraph one. That is, you, so people often say to me, basically, how are they gonna know whether we're doing everything we're supposed to do under the GDPR? They're not, going to invest, they're not going to be able to investigate all this stuff. No, the answer is you have to prove it to them. You have to prove that you are following the principles. And here I say, not legal advice, but I think that means it's helpful to think in terms of you're guilty until proven innocent. So why are we documenting all of this stuff? Why, why do we have to keep... Blah, 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 nobody's ever gonna come and read it. Well, no, they might want to come and read it. And it had better convinced them that you were following the principles from the very first step. Okay? That's why you're doing it. And remember the size of the fines. So, kind of concluding this section. Um, okay, you must comply with the GDPR or just don't conduct business in, in the EU. Okay? And that includes practicing data protection by design. You must evaluate vendors to determine their ability to help you practice data protection by design. Data protection by design is not a technical issue only. And I say, uh, despite the German translation, okay? Any people speak German here? Anybody wanna, I guess not. <laughs> the German translation of data protection by design 
is Datenschutz, data protection, durch Technik, through te technology. Right? That's the opposite of what you want to encourage people to believe. Then we'll apply some technology and we'll do, we've got this data protection by design thing conquered. No, it's about a design thinking approach as the originator of the data protection by design said. Right? Uh, okay, compliance therefore requires, in my view, uh, a fundamental transformation in your business culture. Redesign of your business. And that's what Elizabeth Denham, the ICO commissioner, says. It means a change to the culture of an organization. And this is, guess what, not an easy thing to do. Today, many companies think data protection is just about compliance. It's a mindset that says, my job is to meet the legal requirements as long as I tick the right boxes, I'll be okay. Just tell me what to do so I can get on with my business. That, she says, is not an adequate way of approaching the GDPR. Uh, to meet the challenges I've described, we need to move from a mindset of compliance to a mindset of commitment, okay? As the, uh, as the gentleman said, respect. As the document said in the earlier slide, ethics, an ethical approach. Commitment to managing data sensitively and ethically, not just because it's the law, but because it's good business. And this isn't just the regulators drinking their own Kool-Aid. Okay? Business leaders agree with this, um, with this view of the GDPR. The majority of the challenge needs to be cultural rather than box ticking, says Andrew McClellan, who represents IMRG, which is a retail, um, uh, a retail business group. And uh, City or Citibank, as we used to know it, um, for many business organizations, it may require revisiting the core business model and making sure privacy considerations are considered afresh, et cetera. Okay, so the question is not, in my view, what do I have to do to be in compliance with the GDPR, right? Or what do I have to do to avoid non-compliance? I think the question is, what do I have to be? Right? The environment has fundamentally changed. When the environment changes, the creatures which inhabit that environment need to adapt. They effectively need to turn into a slightly or massively different kind of creature. Thus, what do I have to be in order to survive and hopefully even thrive in this new environment? And the answer is effectively, you need to be like that good neighbor. So I did a um, depressingly long, but kind of interesting, I hope, podcast with, uh, with one of my podcasting heroes, a guy named Horace Diju. Um, and uh, the thing goes on for about 90 minutes. But, so I'm not recommending that you listen to all of it or listen to it on double speed or something. Um, but he threw me at the beginning, because one, he just didn't tell me in advance what questions we were going to discuss. And the very first question, or one of the earliest ones, was the GDPR is not a very elegant name for this thing. Do you have a different name for it? Do you have something better that we could call it? And I didn't know what to say. Uh, I think I referred to, the, to the Cali one of these California, one of the US state legislation proposals, which is about regulating the collection of personal data by internet of things, devices, and specifically household devices, like your refrigerator and your coffee machine and, and your electric blanket. Uh, and it's called the, um, the toasty, toaster and teddy bear law, <laughs> because of the connection, connected toasters and teddy bears. Uh, and so now I think, although this isn't very, very beautiful either, if you want to have a substitute name for the GDPR, it's the good neighbor regulation. You need to be the good neighbor borrowing the neighbor's car. Okay? Um, and so, as I said, the GDPR and the DPAs who are enforcing the GDPR will expect you to embrace that central notion that people should be in control. It dictates some of the behaviors and practices, which we'll see in the second part, uh, that embody, that you should do in order to embody and demonstrate this respect for that Ur principe, but it does not dictate all of them, right? Um, so waiting for further guidance is, is a trap. You're never going to get definitive guidance, in my view, because they will not want to, they will not want to fall into the trap of being too prescriptive, because it immediately makes the, the law brittle. 
right? And makes it possible for you to escape in various ways because it's become prescriptive. So it's not about completing a checklist. It's about documenting and demonstrating that you have revealed and weighed and addressed the risk uh, to data protection and to data protection principles in every one of your business practices. Okay, now we should have a coffee break, but we don't have time. Don't forget. And I hope that by now you, you um, better understand why I think that this statement by Rob Luke is a, um, is a good way of summarizing what they're looking for in the GDPR. And I would even go so far as to say, and now I'm really going out on a limb in terms of non-legal advice, if you can demonstrate convincingly that you, uh, as he says, that, um, that those principles, the, the principles in Article 5, the principles of data protection by design, the principles that reflect subject access rights and so forth, that those principles underpin how you go about doing business under the GDPR, you won't go far wrong. That expression, you won't go far wrong, I think, I take that as the regulators, in the UK at least, saying to you, just embrace the principles. And if you do that properly, if you do that honestly, if you do that genuinely, we're not gonna pay too much attention, right? We don't really care. We might not care <laughs> that you're checking every one of the boxes and that you're following every one of the sentences in uh, the 261 page document, right? You won't go far wrong. That's the way that I understand this statement from the ICO. Okay, now let's go in and look at, given that context, that understanding, uh, the way of understanding what the GDPR wants you to do and wants you to be, let's look at some of the uh, details. What counts as personal data? As I said, they are not going, they are never going to issue a definitive list of what counts as personal data. It is simply data from which a living individual is identified or identifiable either directly or indirectly, and by any means likely to be used. This is one of their future-proofing steps. By any means likely to be used, even if we can't currently imagine them, okay? Even if we don't have the slightest idea that it's possible right now. In updating the GDP, in, in updating the regulation from the Directive 95 to the GDPR in 2016, actually completed at the end of 2015, they uh, very necessarily embraced as well uh, everything that has appeared in the intervening uh, 20 years, um, including things like, now including under personal data, thing, digital signatures like location data and RFID tags and device IDs and cookie IDs and IP addresses and so on and so forth. Think about the effect of that on your everyday business activities and your marketing activities. And there are also things called special categories of data um, biometric data, sexual orientation, whether you belong to a union, right, so on and so forth, that are subject to even more stringent conditions. Okay. What counts as data processing? Virtually anything you can imagine doing with data counts as data processing. So you will often hear me and other people saying that the GDPR is about data collection and processing, but that's actually kind of redundant because data collection is just the first step in processing most of the time. So, such as collection, recording, organization, structure, storage, adaptation, alteration, retrieval, consult consultation, use, dissemination, or otherwise making available, et cetera, et cetera. Merely having personal data, storage, merely having it is processing it, okay? So you can't, it's not adequate to say, well, yeah, we've got some, but we don't use it. <laughs> it's okay, we don't use it. No, you are processing it because you have it. There are new restrictions on profiling, and profiling means any form of automated processing of personal data, okay? Um, in particular, to analyze or predict aspects concerning that natural person's performance at work, economic situation, health, personal preferences, interests, reliability, behavior, location, or movements. If you take out maybe performance at work, 
All of the rest of the things listed in that last sentence are basically exactly what so many of us are now trying to do in terms of creating master, master uh, customer um, profiles and predicting their behavior so that we know how to send them the right message at the right time on the right device and so on and so forth. You do that by trying to ensure that you can predict their interests, preferences, behaviors, movements, location, et cetera, et cetera. And that is now heavily, heavily restricted. Okay, controllers and processors. Controllers are uh, the bodies which determine the purposes uh, and means of processing the personal data and processors carry out the processing. Very often, the, a company will be the controller and the processor, but increasingly so in a cloud-based software environment, the processors will be outside of the company. And uh, again, a little too much detail, but under the directive, only data controllers had to comply with the, with the uh, legislation. Okay? Only data controllers had to comply. A processor who violated some kind of, uh, who violated data protection in one way or another was liable under the contract with the controller, but a data protection authority would not go after the processor. Now processors and controllers are jointly liable. That means that when you, if you're a controller and you are considering hiring, a, engaging a processor, you need to make sure that they are doing, they are capable of doing exactly what they are supposed to do, doing nothing more than they are supposed to do, and that they have a secure environment for, uh, for all of the um, security issues around data protection under the GDPR. Conversely, if you're a processor and you are considering taking some work from a controller, you need to make sure that they have collected the data in a way that's appropriate and in compliance with the GDPR. Because other, if you start processing non-compliant data, you're in violation as well. Right? So it really makes the relationships between, the contract relationships between controllers and processors extremely wrought <laughs> uh, and messy uh, right now. Okay, some key provisions and concepts. N again, not just boxes to check off, but think of these as the building blocks that you're going to use to create that environment in which these new kinds of customer interactions are going to take place. So we said the purpose has to be specified. Data must be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes, and not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. So this raises all kinds of questions about what's a compatible purpose. And guess what? The Article 29 Working Party has issued a, an opinion, an entire opinion of dozens of pages about what constitutes a, in, uh, a compatible and a non-compatible uh, purpose. And we won't get into that. Examples of specific purposes okay, for a business and for an HR department. Because I haven't said so yet, but you probably know, the GDPR applies absolutely equally to employees within an organization as it applies to consumers that are interacting with that corporation. So it's a massive HR a challenge as well. Okay. There are six legal grounds for data processing and only six legal grounds. You, or legal, also called legal basis. You must specify which one of these legal grounds you are appealing to, which one you are basing any data processing activity on. And you can only specify one, okay? For most of, let's say, marketing and customer engagement purposes, the ones that are going to count are consent, the first one, and legitimate interest, the last one. You might also, probably a, a, a decent amount of it will also be on the basis of performance of a contract. But I would caution against abusing the notion of performance of a contract. I just read, was it Twitter? I think it was Twitter's new, don't quote me on that, but um, some international um, social networking service. And they said, hey, you need to go read our new terms and conditions before you can proceed. And, I, and so I, clicked through necessarily, and the first line was, um, this um, um, document creates a contract between the user and the service. I, I don't think that makes sense. Um, I don't know that a DPA is going to let you get away with just saying, hey, every relationship we have with a, with a user of our site is a contract. Must be 
uh, um, uh, must fall under our contract, and therefore, contract is always our legal ground. Then you're really not following the principles, right? Okay, very importantly, this is the one that everybody is, gets concerned about. What constitutes consent, or how do you get consent? Consent means freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's wishes, okay? By a clear affirmative action signaling or signifying agreement to the processing. Okay, so freely given. That means the data subject must be able to refuse. Because it has to be freely given, the DPAs basically say do not use consent in an employer employee relationship. Because we assume that many, if not most, employees are not going to feel that they are in a position to refuse a request from an employer. Okay? May we have your consent to use your, you know, to use your data in the following way? Well, if I say no, am I going to get in trouble? So it creates a bind in which it is assumed the, the employer, the employee cannot freely give their consent. Okay. Very interestingly and, and importantly, provision of a service may not be made contingent on data processing unless the processing is necessary for the provision of the service. Okay. So you can no longer say, by using this site, you agree to blah, 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 okay. unless the collection of personal data is required for the site. So if I'm running an online uh, or digital-based personal shopping service, okay, for Chris, who introduced me, I need to know a lot about him in order to provide that service, in order to send him clothes that fit him, that I think he's going to like, that match what he already has in his closet, and so on and so forth. Okay? A lot of personal data collection and processing is necessary for that, for that service to be provided. Internet search on Google or some other uh, internet search engine does not require the collection of personal data in order to operate. Google will argue that it makes it better, okay? but it's not required. And I think that means that Google is going to have to offer all of us, each of us, uh, by middle of 2018, the option of uh, a data collection-free version of internet search. That's what most people who I put this question to agree with me. Okay, consent must be specific. Okay? It must be requested for a specific purpose. It can't be general or, or omnibus. And if you want to collect a piece of data or some pieces of data for more than one purpose at a given moment, like please fill out this form, uh, and you're gonna be using that data for different purposes, you need to specify each one of the purposes. We are going to use this data for A, B, C, and D, and you must allow the data subject to, to select which ones they agree to. You must allow them to say B and D, yes, but not A and C or only D, but not A, B, and C, so on and so forth. You can't just say, take it or leave it, right? Um, and it has to be informed, okay? Very, very crucial. Consent request must be concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible using plain and clear language. How many of your companies do that today? Mostly consent requests, insofar as they exist, are buried somewhere in the T's and C's, which are buried somewhere in the site that nobody ever goes to. And they are not meant to be read. They are the opposite of concise and transparent. PayPal's T's and C's are, or at least used to be, longer than Shakespeare's Hamlet. 30,000 words, over 30,000 words. Okay? I think this kind of means that um, lawyers are not going to be writing consent requests. Or maybe, let's put it this way, lawyers shouldn't be writing consent request because the consent request, what you communicate in that concise, transparent, and easily intelligible few sentences is going to determine whether or not you persuade that person to allow access to their personal data. And that's what you want. So I think that customer engagement professionals, marketers and customer experience professionals should be writing these consent requests, obviously having them vetted and verified by the lawyers. And you should be writing many of them and testing them in an A-B environment. What kind of formulation is more capable of persuading the data subjects, the visitors, to give us access to their personal data? Okay. It's, a, it's, an, it's an engagement negotiation in a way. 
you will often hear, always, almost always, hear people when they're talking about consent saying, hey, under the GDPR, you now have to get explicit consent. You do not have to get explicit consent. You have to get unambiguous consent. Now, practically speaking, there's not that much difference between unambiguous and explicit. So if you, if you think that it has to be explicit, you're only going to err on the safe side. But the difference is, it has been explained to me like this. If it is announced that uh, during our break, out in the uh, entry hall, they're going to be filming. And if you enter the entry hall, entry hall you are giving permission to be filmed. Okay? That is announced clearly, everybody understands it. If you then enter the entry hall, you are giving unambiguous consent to be filmed. You are taking a deliberate action to acknowledge that, that to express your willingness to be filmed. Okay? That's unambiguous. However, you haven't given explicit consent to be filmed. Explicit consent would require something like signing a form that says, yes, you may film me in this place on this day. That's the difference. Okay? Um, however, that cat all those categories of sensitive data that we talked about earlier, those do require explicit consent. Okay? And again, if you guys or anybody here is responsible for the design of a website, consent must be as easily revoked as it is granted. So that means, remember, concise, inform easily understandable, right? Easily intelligible, so forth. If you have a you know, distinctive part of your site asking for consent, you must, in principle, have an equally distinctive part of your site allow, acknowledging or allowing people to revoke their consent. The revocation cannot be buried, as it now often is, down at the bottom in the footer of some two-point font in the email. Okay. okay, these are examples of consent mechanisms. I won't go into these at all. Uh, examples of ways in which uh, uh, consent can be unambiguously expressed. There are vendors, many of them new, uh, many of them coming from other kinds of backgrounds that are helping with this problem. That is, presenting the consent request. One, you need to do that. Um, char and then, the hard, then, then comes the hard work. We presented the, re the consent request. Who said yes and who said no? Who said yes to what level of granularity? That is, who said A and D but not B and C, and so on and so forth. And then that has to be stored so that you can always go back and prove that they said to, that yes to what you say you, you asked them, and so on and so forth. And it has to be active, interactive, so if they later revoke consent, you can take them out of the positive category, and so on and so forth. That's why you need to start thinking about a consent management solution. You're also going to be issuing privacy notices, which are not the same thing as a consent request. A consent request is asking for consent. A privacy notice is explaining things like um, what you're doing with the, with the data, who you're sharing it with, right? what you're doing in order to make sure that it's secure, if it's being transferred outside of the e European economic uh, area, that is through the US, for example, so on and so forth. Those privacy notices also have to be concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible. But here's one of the areas in which I admit the GDPR is, uh, is self-contradictory, okay? But all of these things have to be communicated in the privacy notice. Have to be. So how can you make your privacy notice or your consent request both transparent, concise, well, sorry, concise and easily intelligible and transparent, because this is all considered transparency provisions. You need to tell, you need to communicate all of these things because the collection needs to be transparent. People need to understand exactly what it is they're agreeing to. Exa exactly what it is they're agreeing to. Who you're going to share it with, what you're going to do with it, where it's going to go, when you're going to give it back or get rid of it, and so on and so forth. How can you do both of those things? How can it be concise and convey all of this information? And the answer that's been proposed and embraced by the data protection authorities is uh, among other things, what's called layered consent. So you basically start with a, re a very concise statement and you say, as you see here, please follow this link for further information. And you go down another layer and you get a greater level of detail. And then you can go down another layer or down another path and get greater level of detail and so on and so forth. 
that's a way of engineering or designing uh, a, a um, designing a system that both conveys all of the information that you need to convey and yet is concise and easily intelligible. Okay. I don't have no idea how much time we have, by the way. Anybody want to tell me? <laughs> like 10 minutes over already? <laughs> okay. Legitimate interest. Hey, this is messy. Uh, and all I'm going to really convey to you is that it is messy. Uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about it in more detail. Okay. Article 6, paragraph 1, section F, says... Processing of personal data is legal if it is necessary for the purposes of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller, data controller, or by a third party. Okay? Legitimate interest is one of the six legal grounds. And again, go to the recital 47 for more clarity. The legitimate interest of a controller may provide a legal basis for processing. And then they add the processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. I was talking to one of the DPAs, the European DPAs, who wrote some of the GDPR, and I said, that sentence, right, direct, referring to direct marketing all of a sudden, that, that looks like the fingerprint of a lobbyist. And she said, yeah, you're right. I mean, she was embarrassed about it. But, she pointed out, it says may be regarded not is to be regarded, may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. So is this a legitimate conclusion based upon those two passages? And this is from an article that appeared at the beginning of the year, I think, actually, uh, 2016. The GDPR is unlikely to have any major ramifications for online marketing. This is primarily due to the revision of Article 6, that is the revision compared to other previous drafts of the GDPR, primarily due to the revision of Article 6, the online marketing clause of the GDPR, by virtue of which the right to process personal data for online marketing purposes is likely to be based on a legitimate interest. I think that is not a legitimate conclusion. I think that's an extremely misleading argument or misleading understanding of what is going on in the GDPR and what will be allowed under the GDPR. First of all, there's no such thing as the online marketing clause of, of the GDPR. It doesn't exist. It's a fiction of somebody's imagination. And secondly, the, the Article 6 continues when it says, um, sorry, let's be careful here. Processing of personal data is legal if it's necessary for the purposes of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller, except where such legitimate interests are overridden by the interest or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which require protection of personal data. Okay. Any, uh, the, the exercise of legitimate interest requires, says Recital 17, a careful assessment. And it calls for what the regulators call a balance test. And it's literally a balance test. It's almost a little crude. You basically conduct a balance test to see whether your legitimate interest as a data controller weigh more than the interest and fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subjects. And if they do, if the conclusion of your balance test is that your legitimate interests do weigh more, then you may use legitimate interest as the legal basis for data processing. Okay? And here's the, here are the things that you include um, in that balance test. Now you can see, I hope, the problem. And the company is conducting the test. It's, in, it's judging itself. Okay? You carry out the balance test to see whether you and your interest outweigh those of the data subject. It's, act, it's like asking a, uh, an accused tax evader to judge his or her own case and to determine what evidence will count in his or her own case and so forth. It, the notion of conducting a balance test is extremely problematic. Or let's just say, it's not problematic, it's just easy to get wrong. Okay? So in, remember the working party 217 that I pointed out to in the glossary, 
This is the 2014 opinion by the Article 29 Working Party on legitimate interest. It's, I don't know what, 61 or 81 pages long or something, and it's only about legitimate interest. So when you read about legitimate interest in the GDPR, don't even begin to think that you understand what's going on until you go and read the entire WP217. And here's the telling example. They say, granted, controllers may have a legitimate interest in getting to know their customers' preferences so as to enable them to better personalize their offers and ultimately offer products and services that better meet the needs and desires of their customers. So it's great. That says that we can collect and process data in order to get our, to know our customers' preferences. But, however, the passage continues, this does not mean that controllers would be able to re rely on legitimate interest. They're referring to Article 7 in the directive, which becomes Article 6 in the GDPR. They would not be uh, allowed to rely upon it to unduly monitor the online or, on or offline activities of their customers, combine vast amounts of data about them from different sources, and create, for example, through the use of intermediary third-party data brokers, complex profiles of the customer's personalities and preferences without that person's knowledge or a workable, and a workable mechanism to object, let alone informed consent. Okay, so kind of defeated again, because the initial paragraph seemed to let data-driven marketing off of the hook, combining massive amounts of data from various sources in order to get to know customers' preferences and better uh, satisfy those preferences. And then the second paragraph says, no, right? This is unduly um, interventionist. Okay. Precisely this, again, I think this describes what a lot of us are trying to do in terms of data-driven uh, marketing and customer engagement. And it says, you, it doesn't say you can't do it. It says you can't use legitimate interest to, uh, as the legal basis. You must rather, uh, if you wanna try to do all of these things, it must be with the subject's full knowledge and informed consent. You can do anything you want <laughs> under the GDPR with consent okay. if you can get the data subjects to go along with it and provide their consent. So legitimate interest, my conclusion, very preliminary conclusion, is an entirely valid and useful ground for data processing. There are many, many ways in which you might want to use it. It does not, however, in contrast to that article that I quoted, justify or protect uh, data-intensive marketing practices. It is not a get-out-of-jail free card for uh, data-driven marketing. Okay. And when you do conduct the test, even if you determine correctly that your interests outweigh those uh, of the data subjects, even if you get it right, everything that you then do with the every processing activity that you then carry out still needs to follow the principles in Article 5 purpose specification, data minimization, storage limitation, so on and so forth. Okay. okay, now we're getting close to the end. Privacy impact assessments, they are very, very important. Uh, I, won't, I won't have time to go in, into them in any uh, detail at all, okay? Um, in, again, in the GDPR, they're called data protection impact assessments, but virtually everybody refers to them as PIAs. Like an environmental impact assessment, the PIA aims to identify risks to the environment, or in this case, to personal data protection, and to mitigate the risks. So you study, what are we proposing to do? What risk does that pose to privacy and, and personal data protection? What are we going to do to mitigate or alleviate all of those risks? Can we do enough, or are the risks still so great that they, um, that they reach basically a high, they remain at a high level, then we have to decide whether we're not, not going to pursue that desired activity, or we're gonna to have to go to the DPA and ask for permission to, continue to pursue this high, still high risk activity. This is how it works. They must be, they ought to be conducted in many instances before you begin any processing activity, but the GDPR says they must be conducted in these uh, instances. Any systematic and extensive evaluation of personal aspects, sounds like data-driven marketing. Automated processing and profiling, same thing. 
processing that produces legal effects concerning natural persons, large-scale processing of sensitive data, remember again, sensitive data, uh, and systematic monitoring of publicly accessible areas like through CTV cameras. Okay, remember my, my graphic trying to help, uh, help me at least understand how this all fits together. Uh, I said we were gonna come back to data subject rights and that's what we're gonna do here in this concluding section. These are the data subject rights. Many of these are, are new or expanded since the directive, okay? Right to be informed, access, rectification, erasure. This is the one you've all heard about, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right to restrict processing, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Data portability. Data portability is meant to do for data <laughs> what number portability did for your mobile phone and your mobile phone service. Remember before number portability, you were stuck with your service provider because people understandably didn't want to have to change their number and inform all of their friends and business contacts that they had a new number. And then finally, somebody um, <laughs> uh, uh, had the clever idea to provide number portability uh, and, or to enforce number portability on the providers and now people can more freely switch providers. And the same thing is at work in data portability. You ought to be able to take your personal data from one provider and shift it to another. Okay. Um, it applies to any data that is submitted by the data subject or, this is very important, or collected under the legal grounds of either consent or performance of a contract. Only those two legal grounds. Okay. Which implies what? that if you collect and process personal data under legitimate interest, it is not subject to data portability. This is another enticement for companies to use legitimate interest rather than consent. And it won't not necessarily mean that it's wrong, but you just have to be very, very careful because of all of the murkiness around legitimate interest as we just saw. Okay? If that uh, data is, uh, if a data subject wants their data, it has to be provided in a commonly used and machine readable format. Okay. And uh, it basically has to be provided for free uh, unless the data subject is abusing their right to data portability or data access uh, and et cetera. Okay. So this should raise a question for all of you in terms of operating your day-to-day your -day business. Um, to, first of all, to what extent do your current systems enable data portability? Okay. So just to be clear, that means that any data subject can contact you and say, do you have any of my personal data? And you need to be able to answer that question with confidence. Okay. You can't say, doesn't seem like it. God, I don't know, I, I guess not. Right. You need to know. Right. That means you need to know all the personal data that you currently hold. Mm -hmm. Then they can say, okay, so you say, yes, we do have some of your personal data. They say, what do you have? You have to give them an inventory, okay? Again, under those conditions that we just saw, uh, if, if provided, if collected under consent or contract or provided freely. Um, then they can say, I want a copy of all of my personal data. You can continue using it, but I want a copy of it. And then they can say, I don't want you to use it anymore. I want to exercise my right to be forgotten. You should delete it all from your systems unless you are legally obligated to keep it for some other reason, okay? And then they can say, don't give it to me, give it to a competitor because I'm going to exercise my rights under data portability. So one, do you have the systems in place to allow that to happen? Most companies don't. I was talking to a guy who's an, an IT professional for a pharmaceutical company in Switzerland, and he was aware of the challenges of responding to these, data, these subject access requests. And he calculated in order to try to um, convince his IT colleagues that this was a, going to be a real problem for them, that it would cost 50 to 60,000 euros for every single subject access request for data portability, just in terms of the cumberness, cum cumbersomeness of looking through all of their current systems and extracting personal data and so on and so forth. And then, more interestingly, and here we get into innovation and creativity, what can you do to, com to try to entice people to shift not only their business, but their business and their personal data from one of your competitors. That personal data might be more valuable than their business. Okay? What can you do to, to, in, to seduce them into exercising their right of data portability and bringing the data to you with their business? 
And then again, what can you do to guard against others doing that to you? Right? I don't have any idea because it depends upon your own business environment. Then, records of processing activities. Uh, again, I, I bet you can't even read this, but these are, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things describing all of the records that you need to keep any time you process any personal data. Why? Because you need to be able to demonstrate that you are in compliance. Okay. And then there are all kinds of other things in the GDPR that I have not even mentioned. Data security is obviously huge. Data security is at least half of the GDPR. It's the one that gets most of the attention. Most of the time when you see a survey about the GDPR, you know, what's your company doing to get ready, how much you're going to spend, how much your budget are you allocating, and so on and so forth, you read all of these results and then you realize they only asked uh, information security professionals. And I say only because, yeah, certainly they should ask information security professionals. This is a massive, massive aspect of the GDPR. It must be secure. Basically, they are saying data security is a huge problem, but it's your problem. <laughs> if you want to process personal data, you figure out how to keep it secure. If you can't figure out how to keep it secure, you shouldn't be processing it. Okay? But all of those issues aside, there's still another big chunk of the GDPR, maybe another half that doesn't have anything to do with data security, but is about, as I've emphasized all morning long, about customer engagement, customer interaction, uh, mutually, mutual exchanges of benefits and trust. So there's breach notification, data transfers outside of the EEA, still very problematic with the US and probably getting more problematic. And um, many, many companies need to appoint a data protection officer. Um, if, you are data, if you're a data professional, this is a boom time for you. Uh, because the um, International Association of Privacy Professionals has estimated that uh, 28,000 DPO positions will be created in Europe and 70,000 worldwide just in order to meet the obligations of the GDPR. Okay, what should you be doing? First steps, laying the foundation. That personal data inventory. You need to begin a long time ago, <laughs> and if you haven't begun yet, you need to begin immediately understanding all of the personal data that you currently hold everywhere, right? In your current systems, in your backup systems, in storage, in your employees' PCs, in your employees' thumb drives, uh, data that you've shared with partners, data that you've shared with service providers, so on and so on and so forth. The analogy that I use is looking for coins in your furniture. Okay? If I say, go home this evening and find you know, six pounds 20 in your sofa or in your furniture. You could probably do it, okay? There's always some coins stuck in your furniture somewhere. But if I say, as the GDPR does in effect, go home this evening and find every single coin in your home, every one of them, do not leave any single one of them undiscovered. It's a virtually impossible task because how do you know if you found every one? Okay? So this is a huge, huge problem. And there are some automated systems that are beginning to be introduced to help you do this, to help you discover data, but it's still very much, uh, it, it's still very much at least based upon, if not dependent upon, asking people where they might have put stuff. Uh, and then, once you think you've found it, if you found all of it or you found some of it, then you need to basically audit it, okay? Where did it come from? What is it, first of all? Is it really personal data? Where did it come from? Under what conditions did we collect it? That is, what did we say we were going to do with it? What did we ask for, right, when we collected it? What role does it play in what business processes and so forth? But I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. The, I don't know if this is a, a term of art in English uh, legal um, language, but the grandfather clause, okay? That is, what about our currently existing data? Can we continue to use it? Is it grandfathered in under the GDPR? No, <laughs> basically no. You can continue to use personal data after May 25th, 2018, if it was collected under conditions which comply with the GDPR. But who would have been collecting personal data under the conditions of the GDPR before it came into effect? Or at least before it came known? Okay. Not that many. 
So it's likely that when you do discover, begin discovering and interrogating your personal data uh, that you currently hold, that it was not collected uh, under appropriate conditions. And then you have to ask, well, are we going to stop using it? Basically, you have to delete it, okay? One, one, uh, one possibility is delete it. The other possibility is go back and ask for consent under the proper conditions. And then how do you do that? Okay? Imagine yourself as a consumer and you get an email or some other notification on a website that says, you know, we just wanted to let you know that we've got a whole bunch of your personal data <laughs> and can we continue using it for these purposes? I think most people are gonna be inherently suspicious so again, I think that's a, that's a challenge for marketers. That's a challenge for customer engagement professionals. How do you convince those suspicious consumers to allow you to continue using data that you've collected before the GDPR? I think as, as important as the uh, data inventory and audit is a knowledge, in, a knowledge audit. Who needs to know, who in your organization needs to know about the GDPR? And the answer is virtually everyone <laughs> to some extent, okay? The board needs to know about the GDPR because they are ultimately going to weigh the risk that the company's willing to take by processing personal data of various kinds, okay? Especially when exposed to those kinds of fines. HR needs to know because there are massive, massive training efforts that have to be undertaken and continued and maintained. Um, salespeople, if you're a vendor, Increasingly, if it's not happening already, when you go to see a client or a prospect there and you start doing your, what we used to call dog and pony show, I used to be a vendor myself, they're gonna say, yeah, great, but how does this help me? Tell me about how this helps with that GDPR thing that I'm so worried about. And the salespeople and the pre-sales engineer who's doing the demo need to have a response. They don't need to be GDPR experts, but they need to say, yes, our company has a program, blah, 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 and I'm gonna put you in touch, et cetera, et cetera. So, if a lot of different people in the organization need to know about the GDPR, they need to know various kinds of things. They need to have various levels of knowledge. How do you help them achieve that level of knowledge and maintain that level of knowledge? And then when you're discovering your, your personal data, one of the questions, one of the biggest question potentially is not where did we get it? What do we do with it? What role does it play in our business? How, what value does that process produce for us? And then again, do we want to do the work necessary to continue that process or a version of that process? Do we want to redesign it, get renewed consent, et cetera, et cetera, and carry it on through the under GDPR conditions? Or do we want to give it up? Right? You have to weigh the, the cost and the benefit, basically. If we want to redesign it, who's going to help us? And here again, this is the design aspect. Do we have the resources necessary to design this properly, or should we be looking for outside assistance to help us understand how to best design this process for the best outcomes for us and for the consumer, and so forth. Okay, talking about Kentico and, and content, uh, I think I've exposed a number of, of large content workloads uh, around consent, securing, tracking, surfacing, discovering, consent requests and consent responses. Um, formulating and tracking and deploying uh, privacy notifications and recording, tracking, monitoring, managing, being able to present all of those records of processing activities. Those are at least the prominent content workloads. Finally, um, the, the new world of marketing under the GDPR. I mean, what, what are the benefits to you as marketers if you can achieve them? Okay? if you can achieve them. Clean databases, imagine. A database in which you know, first of all, that you have permission to interact with these people. You don't have to guess. Who was it in the UK that was recently fined? Maybe one of the auto, automobile manufacturers? Um, because they, they basically lost control of their database. And they woke up one morning and said, we don't really know any longer which of the people in this database gave us permission to market to them, to email uh, to them, and which didn't. So they wrote to everybody in the database and said, can you tell us whether we have permission to send you emails? 
Well, of course, for a significant number of those people, they didn't have permission to send them emails, even to ask them if they had permission to send them emails. So they were fined over 100,000 pounds. Okay. Having a clean database means you don't have to worry about that, right? And the other one was the famously, was it, uh, is it called Witherspoons, the, the, the pub chain that just said, forget it, it's too complex. They erased their entire email marketing database. So we're not gonna do it anymore, right? They surrendered. That's the radical, uh, the radical extreme. Transparency, you begin to prove that you are providing transparent interactions with consumers because 70% of Europeans are concerned that their personal data is, may be used for purposes other than that for which it was collected. They think, they, they, they assume that. Their working assumption is that uh, they are not receiving transparent communications. And you, be able, you begin to prove that you, you provide exchanges with mutual benefit. 62% okay. of consumers are not confident that sharing data with companies will result in better services or more relevant products. You need to show the benefit that they get for that data. It can't be, we're going to, in, in order to improve your site experience, that's not a testable benefit. How do I know whether, it is, whether you've provided that benefit to me? It has to be something I can feel, that I can measure, that I can acknowledge, yes, you said you were going to do X, and by God, you did it or you didn't, okay? Those are the kinds of exchanges you need to start working on. And just finally, building, and this is what the GDPR, the regulators want you to do, as we see again and again from Elizabeth Denham and the ICO, build business relationships, build relationships with your customers and your prospects that are based upon engagement and genuine trust. And if you can do that, if you can achieve those trust-based interactions and trust-based relationships, you will undoubtedly have a competitive advantage in the short term uh, and a much more solid foundation for business success in the longer term as consumers become more and more aware of the abuses that have been taking place uh, in digi digital marketing exchanges. And I'm gonna stop there. Okay, I've got one more section, but that's it. Thanks. <laughs>